I understand that you've already had some Korean history, uh, but it never hurts to 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 repeat um, what what you've learned. And so hopefully I'll be able to take Park Kyung Lee's literature as an opportunity to introduce you or reintroduce you to very salient and important milestone events in modern Korean history. Those events certainly shaped Park Kyung Lee's life and her work. And so uh, if I do my job well, all of these things will seem organically woven together. So um, I asked uh, Professor Che to share uh, The Age of Doubt, a short story uh, written by Park Kyung Lee in 1957. And hopefully some of you had a chance to take a look uh, and also to recommend um, parts of land. Uh, Professor Che mentioned that it's 21 volumes. Uh, when it was the version that I know was 16 volumes, uh, it's certainly been published over and over in longer and longer um, uh, versions. Um, and not all of it, all, the five part uh, Roman flow have been translated. Uh, but there's part one that's available in English translation. So maybe some of you are able to take a look at that. Um, so I will mention the age of doubt and uh, land. We'll maybe be able to read a little bit together from the age of doubt. And I'll um, weave the reading into what I'm calling the braided histories of the individual that Park kyung was, the family, uh, in which her life was embedded with the national history. As you know, the 20th century was, for the most part, a pretty tumultuous and pretty catastrophic century for the Koreans. Uh, and so every life was not, um, there was no life that was not untouched by that uh, national history. And along the way, uh, we'll ask, we'll try to place Park kyung Lee within and the terrain of Korean literary history more broadly, and ask what it means to be a woman writer. What, what kind of gender subjectivity did Park kyung Lee have? And what kind of example or inspiration did she provide for successive generations of women writers? Especially the writer Gong Ji Young, who I understand you'll be meeting in person. Gong Ji, for Gong Ji Young, I mean, Gong Ji Young, um, a number of occasions talked about Park kyung Lee as, as the writer who's had the most impact on her life. And so we'll be able to think about those questions together. Here's a picture of Park kyung Lee from 1957 when The Age of Doubt, her short story that you uh, read, um, won a prestigious literature award in Korea. All right, so um, The Age of Doubt, Let's start with that work. Um, it's one of the 101 masterpieces of Korean short fiction selected by a pretty famous and accomplished writer himself, Hwang Seo Gyeong. Um, and it appears in volume three of that collection. And the volume three, I, you see an image of the cover book cover here. And the theme of that volume three uh, is like weeds among the ruins. Okay. Um, among the ruins suggests the Korean War. If you hear the word peho or ruin in Korean, uh, most Koreans will immediately think about the Korean War. And so being weeds among the ruins suggests life that survives right amid great destruction and death. And indeed, the collection it, of stories in this volume all attest to the power of the human uh, instinct, the power of human will to survive amid just catastrophic set of events. Okay, so um, I thought maybe we would have some students read this out loud, uh, but in the interest of time, because I feel like uh, we lost some minutes, I'll just go ahead and read 
out loud, just the first page of the Age of Doubt, okay? So um, the night before the second battle of Seoul, a bomb killed Jin Young's husband. But before that happened, he had told her about a death he had witnessed of a North Korean soldier on Gyeonggin Road. The soldier was so young, he might as well have still been a boy. The boy soldier lay beneath a tree on the avenue, hordes of flies attacking his, his exposed entrails like flesh-eating demons. He was begging for a sip of water and calling for his mother in a trance-like state. A fleeing passerby had taken pity on him and left behind a cracked open watermelon, but the boy was unable to eat it and his breath slowly left his body. The story foreshadowed his own death as Jin Young's husband died in a bombing just a few hours after telling it to her. Now widowed Jin Young during the third battle of Seoul put a child on her back and left the city with a mother at the last possible moment. But not only did the Chinese army catch up with them before they even reached Anyang, they were bombarded by the UN forces. Countless refugees littered the icy ground. The bull yoked to their wheelbarrow rolled into a ditch along with their belongings. A child cried by a body bleeding out in front of him. Jin Young turned and ran from the scene as fast as, fast as she could. And now the nightmare, nightmarish war was over. Jin Young, holding the hand of her son, Moon Su, returned to the ruins of Seoul. The ground their house had stood on was a pile of rubble, covering up the normally exposed foundation stones. From among the roof tiles scattered in the weeds, she fished out a single damp and worn book a survey of French literature written in Japanese. This volume had once resided on a bookshelf. The image came to her like a brief, vivid moment. Okay, all right. So this is the opening page of The Age of Doubt. And as those of you who read the uh, story uh, know that um, it goes on. Um, to talk about Jin Young's own struggles uh, and doesn't much talk about the times in which she lives. And yet this first page sets us up. Even this one, two pages, uh, we find so many references to the historical background. So I just quickly went through and started underlining some of those references. And here's the first one, obviously, the second battle of Seoul. Uh, and any of you who want to ask questions about it or have uh, answers for it, you know, feel free to stop me at any, any point and raise your uh, WebEx hand. A North Korean soldier on Kyung In Road, right? The third battle of Seoul. The Chinese army and bombardment by the UN forces. And lastly, it doesn't seem very historical, but it is indeed a survey of French literature, but a survey written in Japanese. Uh, so just to get a sense of what all of these references are to, takes us into the realm of history. Or North Korean attack, and then the UN on the defensive, right? They end up being holed up in, all the way in the southeastern corner called the Busan perimeter. Busan is a major city in Seoul. Um, Hadong is not too far away. Um, and then the second phase where uh, the United States and uh, the UN command intervene in the war and they intervene uh, an offensive uh, marked by the landing in Incheon. So here's a question to Kyo, that Svenja asked, Gyeongin Road. So if you see the map here, the Incheon, Incheon is a port city right here. Uh, for a long time, I mean, for about two and a half months, the UN South Korean forces are holed up in this Busan perimeter here and the UN forces come in, land in Incheon, and then cut the North Korean soldiers off 
right, at the, at the waist. And that proved to be a very brilliant strategy, and that reverses the tide of war. So Gyeonggi Road, Incheon, Seoul used to be called um, Gyeongseong, or, or Gyeong meaning the capital. So Incheon, In, and Seoul, Gyeong, Gyeongseong, Gyeonggi Road is a road connecting Incheon and Seoul, right? So basically, the presence of the North Korean soldier on the Gyeongin Road tells us that Gyeongin Road was one of the ma major sort of battle routes, and it's the route that the UN forces took to retake uh, Seoul after landing in Incheon. Phase three, the Chinese enter, right? So the important thing about phase two is that UN offensive is successful, UN forces managed to drive the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel, right in the middle of the peninsula. And they have a decision to make. Because there was North Korea and South Korea before the war began, they were now able to restore what was called the status quo antebellum, what was in place before the war. So they could just walk away from that point and say the war is over or try to negotiate for the end of war, formal end of war. But the UN forces decided under US, really the US forces decided that now they have the military advantage, it's possible to push the North Koreans back and reunite the entire Korean Peninsula under the UN command. So that's the decision that they make. And for somebody like uh, a war philosopher such as Walzer, Michael Walzer, the first intervention in the Korean War by the UN forces was just intervention. But at this point, it becomes a new war. It's an un it becomes an unjust war because it goes beyond restoring the status quo antebellum. So at that point, after the UN forces push across the 38th parallel, and drive the North Koreans back, the Chinese enter, they are very, very fearful of having the UN forces right at the border of North Korea and, and China. China, uh, the communist Chinese party had just won a very difficult war against the nationalists. And they, they, are, they feel threatened by the, uh, the presence of the UN forces in what used to be North Korea. Uh, and the Chinese entrance, entry into the war changes the tide of war once again, so that the UN forces are forced to escape and retreat from the port of Hungnam. That's phase three. Uh, Seoul falls as the Chinese push their advantage. And the famous January 4th retreat the fall of Seoul to the communist Chinese communist forces and, and the retreat from Seoul is has become the material for much cultural representation in Korea because it was so, so difficult. And that's where the third battle of Seoul just mentioned in uh, the Age of Doubt happens when the Chinese uh, forces take over Seoul. Phase four. The United States, United Nations counteroffensive, and the Chinese uh, Communist Forces offensive. This back and forth movement happens um, in 1951, and fighting uh, Seoul is recaptured by the UN forces, and the fighting more or less stabilizes around the 38th parallel, and from that point on, you have negotiation talks begin that begin and no major sort of change in, in territorial possessions by the different forces. So the Korean War timeline, and you see how um, uh, Jin Young and, and her life and, and the background to um, the age of doubt happens right within this history. Okay, um, there was, but there was also reference to the French literature, survey of French literature in Japanese in that piece, right, that we just read. Um, and so the question after thinking about the Korean War period 1950 is how did the Korean War come about? What was Korea like before the Korean War, right? 
And what is this existence of Japanese uh, language French literature survey suggest about that historical background? And so to answer that, to answer that question, we need to go back a little bit further in history to uh, the Japanese colonial rule of Korea in the first half of the 20th century. What lays the ground for that is actually the mid 19th century in East Asia. So I'm giving you some very uh, broad uh, strokes of uh, history in 19th and 20th century Korea. Uh, the mid 19th century in East Asia was a time of Western aggression. So China, Japan, Korea, all of them had so-called, at the time they felt, they called it barbarians at the door. So Western forces that were kind of threatening um, these polities uh, by force of arms. Um, I'm not going to go into it, into it, but the opium wars in China led to unequal treaties and foreign concessions in China. Turn China, which was for, for so many centuries, the middle kingdom into this label, sick, the sick man of Asia. Japan, Commodore Perry's black ships appeared mid 19th century uh, on, 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 the, on the shores of Japan, of those island archipelago, uh, led to forced opening. But the response that Japan had to the appearance of the West on its shores was different led to a political revolution, civil war within Japan. The, the faction that won uh, opted for modernization of the country, sent out study and diplomat, diplomatic missions uh, to parts of the West, right, including the US, France, Germany. Uh, in other words, Japan became a model student of modernization which at this time is really westernization. Korea, the smallest of the East Asian countries among the three, also belated encounter with French and American forces. Um, their response completely different, went a completely different way. They opted to isolate themselves further and the, the label that became uh, characteristic of uh, Korea was that it was a hermit kingdom. And it was only at the very end of the 19th century, starting in 1894, there were attempts at modernization from within uh, in Korea. Um, those attempts I'm calling belated because Japan had modernized and become powerful um, in, in the Western uh, mode and was now becoming, uh, developing imperial ambitions. And so Japan would not allow Korea to kind of modernize alone on its own, at its own pace. So here's an example of the philosophy of modernization that Japan took as a model student of the West. A uh, very influential thinker named Fukuzawa Yukichi, who in 1885, argued that Japan needed to leave Asia and enter Europe in order to, to survive in this age of empires, right? Western civilization is like the wind. Every blade of grass and every tree in the East will have to follow what the Western wind brings, he says. It's also like the measles. We don't love it, we might hate it, but it's inexorable, that's the idea, right? And the other Asian neighbors, East Asian neighbors, China, Korea, the Confucian sphere in which Japan had operated for, for centuries, those friends are not coming along with us. They are holding us back. We have to leave the ranks of Asian nations and cast our lot with civilized nations of the West. Okay. But once having left Asia, entered Europe, and you see here the image uh, the satirical comic image from Puck in 1899 that shows Japan kind of being inducted into the League of Nations, right? But League of Nations that are Western nations. And then you see in the background here on the other side of the wall, China kind of looking on enviously. Um, but once having left Asia and entered Europe, it comes back to Asia 
as an imperial power. And so here, Japan returns to Asia. Also, a um, couple of images that can help you, um, I think, grasp the essence of this message in a very graphic way. Um, Western civilization is not some neutral power, neutral concept. It was understood by Japan as a hierarchy, a necessary hierarchy. As you see on the left, image on the left, as a doll's house, right? It is tiered, it is, it is hierarchical. Hierarchical that is based on technology, your ability to shrink space time, right? Steamship, uh, telegraph poles, right? Hot air balloon, trains. Your, the technology that will allow you to traverse miles and miles that would have taken days and days upon days in a matter of hours. And upon those technology, you can now array the nations of the world, right? European nations standing militarily, European nations also sitting with culture, right? Music. And then the two on the bottom, two Asian nations, not standing, not sitting, but kneeling in almost beast-like poses. As you might imagine what these countries represent, well, you can see from the headgear, the top knot of Joseon Dynasty Koreans on the left, and the queue of the Manchurian Chinese on the right, China or China. So returning to Asia means bringing this Western civilization to Asia. Here's Tokyo Park in 1911, the year after Japan annexed Korea, right? Um, the governor general, Terauchi, the Japanese general, strikes the wall of the cave in which the Koreans are dwelling in the dark, right? And brings the light of morning. You see the crow, right? Rooster, bringing the uh, announcing, heralding the morning, and the light of civilization shines upon Koreans. But that light of civilization originates in Goddess Amaterasu, the Japanese goddess. So, the picture of Western civilization in uh, brought to Korea, brought to other parts of Asia through Japan involved an inherent hierarchy of power in which Koreans were um, obviously uh, occupying the lower rungs. So formal annexation of Korea happens in 1910 and it lasts until 1945. It goes through many different phases, at least three different phases, but the phase that Koreans remember most strongly is a last phase when Korea became part of the Japanese imperial expansion project and the war that it was beginning to fight, starting with the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937. And as many of you would know, the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 that got Americans involved in World War II. So Koreans became, uh, Koreans placed within that empire, within that expanding and uh, war fighting empire became one of providing economic uh, resources to the empire at war. Peoples were mobilized within the empire. You know, uh, the sexual slavery of uh, the so-called comfort women that you have heard about, the forced mobilization of uh, Koreans into factories and mines um, of different parts of the Japanese empire happened uh, during this time, and to ensure, and also Koreans, so Korean soldiers, Korean young men were conscripted into the Japanese army to ensure Koreans' loyalty to the empire. Um, the Japanese felt that a separate cultural identity would really threaten the Koreans' ability to fight alongside Japan against a common enemy that is the West, right? Um, uh, U.S. and England. And so this was also the period when there was a systematic destruction of separate Korean cultural identity, Korean language, Korean names, right? 
Koreans were encouraged, quote unquote, to worship at Shinto shrines. Shinto being the Japanese national religion, et cetera, et cetera. So Koreans remember this last phase with extreme hatred and bitterness. But there were many Koreans who actually prospered under the Japanese colonial rule. And so one uh, legacy of Japanese colonial rule that lasted 35 years in Korea is that Koreans themselves were internally divided uh, between peasants and bourgeoisie, between those who fought and who continued to uh, maintain, um, continued to struggle against the Japanese colonial rule, and those who made their fortunes serving and becoming part of the Japanese uh, imperial enterprise. So probably the two most famous examples of the collaborator versus patriot dichotomy in, in Korean nationalist history are these two guys. Uh, Lee Wan Yong on the left, he was a high ranking minister whose signature you will find on the document that annexes Korea to Japan. And you'll see, you see in this image all of the medals and honors that he received from the Japanese empire. He received the highest honor that was that is given the honor of chrysanthemum uh, that the Japanese uh, empire gives to any foreigner. Right? Um, Iwan Yong was a recipient of that. On the right, you have An Jung Gun and prominently displayed the missing fourth digit on his hand. He cut that digit off to generate enough blood to write a suicide note before he went and assassinated Ito Hirobumi, a statesman of Japan and someone who was largely, widely considered to be the architect of the Japanese um, annexation of Korea. So the hated Japanese colonial rule comes to an end on August 15th, 1945, when Japan is defeated in World War II. And you see here, uh, the day after um, the J Japanese surrender, the release of prisoners from Mapo prison in Seoul, political prisoners, and the, and the spontaneous joy and euphoria that many of them express at, at being liberated from colonial rule. Koreans to this, this day call the Independence Day, August 15, 1945, literally the day the light was restored to the world, right? Um, that's uh, that's the, the degree to which there has been an affective investment in, uh, on, the, on the Liberation Day. Okay, uh, and so bring this, bringing this back to Park Kyung Lee, Park Kyung Lee's literature, um, Poji or Land, her magnum opus, is a story that takes this entire history as the background for a multi generational tale it weaves of uh, of Korea, right? So in five parts and sixteen volumes. The story begins at the very end of the 19th century with Korea trying to modernize, right? Um, as you know, the, the Japanese imperial power uh, and other imperial powers are kind of looming in the background. Um, and with a rebellion by, it, it begins with a peasant rebellion um, that sought to kind of to, to change the Korean, old Korean system for the better without kind of falling into the westernization uh, mode. Okay, so the story of Toji, which takes begins in 1897 and goes all the way to 1945, the end of Japanese colonial rule, you can see in this timeline that the theme of resistance is very important. Resistance, political national resistance, resistance to uh, foreign oppression, um, but also resistance to feudal class, uh, feudal forms of, of oppression. So the narrative really focuses on female characters and their uh, love plots, love lines that kind of cross the, the class divide um, and takes that story from Hadong in South Gyeongsang province in Korea overseas to parts of Northeast Asia, including the Manchurian region where there were a lot of independence uh, activism happening during the Japanese colonial rule. 
and and maps that narrative. Um, so resistance, double double resistance, resistance to social mores that oppress uh, class and oppress women, and and to political oppression. Right? Okay. Um, and Park Kyung Mi, uh, as you might guess from uh, the plot of Toji, the very brief summary that I just gave you, um, you know, there's really no love lost for for Japan in Park Kyung Mi's uh, worldview. So, um, you know, she wrote a number of pieces, essays on on Japan, reflections on on, on Japan, and these reflections were. Uh, combined, collated and combined into a published volume called Sundry Thoughts on Japan, um, came out in 2013. And she has, um, you know, some of the famous uh, expressions from these essays that have circulated more recently in Korea um, under the, the kinds of tensions, renewed tensions with Japan. Um, she has said that it has been a singular misfortune of Koreans to have had Japan as a neighbor, and that the Japanese uh, do not understand ritual propriety or ye. Right? This term I'm going to come back to later, so I want you to kind of keep that in mind. Instead of, uh, you know, you treat them with this ritual propriety, um, they will see it as a kind of a weak, a weakling trying to uh, curry favor, an example of toadyism, and then kind of step on you. So what you consider, what Koreans consider to be ritual prop, ritually proprietous uh, action toward other or neighbor would be interpreted as expressions of power in the Japanese case. So that's the point that um, Park Young-ni was making in these essays. Okay. So coming back to 1945, so end of Japanese colonial rule in 1945, and then we talked about the history of the Korean War beginning in 1950. What happened during those five years from 1945 to 1950? How did Korea become separated, divided, partitioned into two in the first place? So let me talk about that history briefly before returning to Park Young-mi again. So mention that August 15, 1945 is celebrated in Korea as the day light was restored. Um, but that very day, actually, two Korean leaders, nationalist leaders, expressed very different reactions. Uh, intellectual, a Quaker intellectual um, named Ham Sak Han, liberation, he says, came as a thief in the night. What does that mean? It came unexpected, unexpected by Koreans. And why was that a problem? Well, here's the Korean nationalist activist Kim Gu, who was in exile in China. The day the Korea light was restored to Korea, many of Korean nationalist leaders were in exile in other places and not in Korea, including Kim Gu. His response was to cry in and, 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 and to cry in tears. We should have shed blood. What do we now say to the Allied powers? Korea, Korean liberation came as a thief in the night. Well, you might say after 35 years with so many Koreans, you know, wanting and, and begging and, and shedding blood for liberation. How could you say that it came too soon? Um, well, you know, I'm not saying that it came too soon. I'm saying that it came unexpectedly because the Koreans were not ready, not in place within Korea to receive surrender from Japan or to gain power or to create a counter state, right? Uh, and what happened in the absence of that was Korea's fate became something to be decided by the larger powers who won the war, uh, meaning the Allied powers. Uh, and as early as 1943 in Cairo, when the Allied powers, and you see here, China represented, nationalist China in the form of Chiang Kai-shek, United States, 
President Roosevelt, right? Churchill, and then you see Stalin, right? You see Churchill again, uh, and in Yalta, right? Okay, Tehran Conference Yalta in Crimea, in the news uh, nowadays in the Ukraine. Um, the view was here that these great powers would be like the policemen over the world. In fact, four policemen in the newly liberated globe after the defeat of the Axis powers. And Korea shall in due course become free and independent. The operative word there is in due course. The view here was that Korea was not ready to tackle its own independence or to, to carry its independence. Uh, to manage its own independence. So then there had to be a period of trusteeship by these big powers to guide them along, right, to the point where they would be able to take their own government into their own hands. If you're Korean and if you've been under the Japanese rule for 35 years, you're not happy with this option right? or with this vision. Uh, and indeed, most Koreans were not. And that begins to set the ground for the trouble to come later. Um, those of you in Germany, here's the Potsdam Conference. Um, now, the end of the war was predicted. I mean, the Axis defeat was predicted, um, but it was it still came very suddenly. Uh, so certainly. The Koreans who were agitating for the defeat of the uh, Japanese uh, empire uh, was not expecting it to happen in August 1945. They expected the war to be drawn out. And the war ended as quickly as it did because the United States deployed atomic bombs. First one in, on Hiroshima, uh, August 6, 6, 1945, the little boy. Right, which decimated, took out about a third of the entire city and followed by Nagasaki, the fat man, right? Um, up to 80,000 deaths in a city of estimated 250,000 in population. This has a momentous impact on Korea and re-signifies the East Asian region or the United States especially. Now, United States, looking at East Asia during World War II, saw in Japan an enemy. After the dropping of the atomic bomb, Japan also became a victim. And because of the violence being so unimaginably uh, catastrophic, right? Um, and as the world quickly became ensnared in Cold War, the war between the so-called free world and the communist world, right? Uh, a a, a two-world system um, that sustained the Cold War logic. Japan also went from a victim to a very important ally for the United States. Japan was going to be where the, um, Japan will, would, would be the base for the United States. Uh, apparatus, right, um, in, in East Asia. What happened to China? Um, well, United States supported Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalist Party in the Chinese Civil War. And guess what? The Nationalists lost. And so now China was lost. China was lost from the U.S. perspective to Reds, to the Communists. So China, the nationalist China that would have been one of the four policemen to superintend the world in post-World War II order, went from four policemen to you know, the enemy, right? The threat, the red China that, was, that would engulf the world if left alone, right? And that would be kind of partner to the Soviet Union. What about Korea? Korea went from a victim of an enemy, right? Because when Japan was America's victim, I mean, when Japan was America's enemy, Korea was Japan's colony. In other words, Korea was a victim of America's enemy. But now that Japan was no longer quite a, vic 
quite an enemy, but a victim of atomic bomb and also an ally of a newfound world order, what would a victim of a victim become? What kind of moral category is a victim of an ally? And Korea also became the front line in the battle against communism. What ended up happening in Korea upon liberation from 1945 to 1950 then is Korea got the occupation package that was originally designed for Japan. America's attitude toward Korea became one of uh, a punitive one, right? Uh, looking at uh, dealing with hostile enemy. So bottom line, and this is not my words, but a diplomatic historian, a famed diplomatic historian, Lloyd Gardner, he has this to say about the US policy toward Korea. It was always about someplace else. It was about Japan, it was about China, it was about Soviet Union. Okay, that sets the ground, I think, for thinking about the US occupation of South Korea and Soviet occupation of North Korea, and the leaders who were selected to lead both countries. And as the relationship between Stalin and Truman fell apart, as the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union became a hostile one in the Cold War, remember they were allies in World War II, but at the end of World War II, they were very suddenly and quickly becoming enemies, leading the, the two, two world system, right? Uh, Korea became uh, the crucible where those tensions erupted. So in 1947, so Korea was divided into North, uh, Soviet occupation in the North and, and US military occupation in the South. And then how would these forces then withdraw from Korea? In 1947, Soviet proposed that they withdraw simultaneously. Uh, US said, no, we would, we would like to have the UN monitor election of 1948 in 1948 first. So a separate South Korean general elections was held in May 1948. Lots of people, including Kim Go, lots of nationalist leaders in South Korea, uh, in, in, in both Koreas, really, really argued against separating and formalizing the division into these separate republics. But that's what happened in 1948 in South Korea first, and then followed in North Korea by their own uh, election, um, leading to uh, the establishment of the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea in, in the North, and then the separate South Korea Republic of Korea in the South. Okay, so then that's what sets the, the stage for the 1950 formal outbreak of the Korean War, neither side, neither North nor South is happy with the situation in which they have, you know, the country separated in the middle. Whichever side has military advantage would try to press that advantage to unify the country, the peninsula, and Kim Il-sung had the military advantage in 1950 in June. Okay. Um, so here's Park Young Lee, major events in Park Young Lee's life. Park Young Lee was born in 1926 in Gyeongsang, South Gyeongsang province, in a, in a city that is often called the Napoli of, uh, of Korea, Tongyang. It's a sea, seaside town. In 1945, she graduates from a prestigious girls' high school in Jinju. And that very same year, she marries a, a, a guy named Kim Hengdo. And uh, you see the picture here of their family. Um, and, and, and the older woman sitting down is Park Young Lee's mother, uh, who actually had a very unhappy married life because her husband had a second family, second wife uh, that he lived with. And so Park Young Lee from, from young age, um, you know, suffered from um, having a father who is largely absent. Uh, and so Park Young Lee took care of her own mother. So that's why you see her in the picture. Um, you, you don't often see the maternal, in, 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 you know, it's, it's more likely to see the paternal uh, side represented in a picture like this, but 
outcome. That's the reason why you see uh, Park Young Lee's mother here. Okay, uh, and then the year after Park Young Lee moved to Incheon, the city, remember the Incheon Landing, Kyungin Road, uh, when her husband Kim Hengdo started working for the Tobacco and Ginseng Bureau of the U.S. military government. The reason that is interesting is because the Tobacco and Ginseng Bureau was something that was organized under the Japanese colonial rule. And there were many aspects of Japanese colonial apparatus that the United States military government just took over and kept, right? And inherited and preserved, which also meant, you know, uh, caused a lot of problems for Koreans who, who, who thought that, well, the colonial rule ended, the colonial forms of power should end also. 1950, she graduates from Teachers College in Seoul. The same year, her husband is jailed, arrested as a leftist, as a communist, and jailed in the infamous Sodemun prison. Infamous because this was also, Sodemun prison was where the colonial, Japanese colonial government kept the independence fighters, the political prisoners. So the fact that this was kept alive, right, also meant undesirable continuity between colonial and post-colonial periods. Um, and he dies in December of that year. 1953, Park Young-mi's son dies. And some of that autobiography works its way into the age of doubt, where you have uh, Jin Young, Jin Young um, grow desperate because her son is killed, um, essentially a medical accident. And then in 1955, Park Young-mi debuts as a writer with a short story called Calculations of Kaesan. Okay, so this is sort of Park young lees life. Now we know, right? Having gone through the Korean history briefly, uh, but hopefully effectively, um, where this maps onto national history timeline. So 1926, this is during the Japanese colonial period, right? Um, so Japanese colonial rule. Um, this is the liberation from Japan, the defeat, the end of World War II, right? Um, 1946, the occupation period, uh, the formal occupation, military occupation of Korea by the United States, the southern half, lasted from 1945 to 1948. And you see, you know, that's when Kim started working for the, for the U.S. military government. And 1950, uh, is the Korean War, okay? And 1953 is when Korean War ends in a ceasefire, okay? All right, so coming back to the age of doubt, um, the first time we encounter these opening pages, we noted the historical references, okay? But now maybe we can move to a thematic one and the key detail that I'd like to draw your attention to is this line. The boy soldier lying beneath a tree on the avenue and hordes of flies attacking his exposed entrails. This is a thematic occupation that I think helps us ask and answer the question, what gives rise to, or what makes a time period, what makes an age, an age of doubt? And here, I'd like to kind of quibble a little bit with the translation. It's translated as the age of doubt, but in Korean, it's pushinshide. I think it's more properly translated as the age of distrust or even mistrust. Uh, doubt feels a little bit more positive than, than, um, than the original Korean word. Um, what, what makes a time a time of mistrust and distrust. This, in absolute terms, is a time of great misery, right? The Korean War, Seoul in ruins in 19, still in 19, or in 50s. Think about Park Young Lee's husband, who worked for actually US government, being called communist leftist and dying in prison in post-colonial Korea, in the colonial prison of Sodemun, right? Um, and in that, within that historical milieu, how are people surviving? 
people are surviving like hordes of flies attacking the exposed entrails of a dying young boy conscripted into the North Korean army. In other words, survival becomes a model that allows, justifies anything and everything. Uh, look at, uh, remember these characters, Karol Tong Ajumani and her financial schemes, this rotating credit association, the gold tooth that flashes, catches light whenever she smiles or when she opens her mouth to eat, right? Um, Sangbe's father, uh, Karol Tong Ajumani has a border and she manages, she's Catholic, so she manages to convert a border Sangbe to Catholicism, but later, you know, basically they're using Sangbe's father, they're using that connection to um, borrow money from her and not, not pay it back. Uh, representations of the Catholic and Buddhist clergy in the novel, right? I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the work. They're supposed to be holy, right, clerics, and yet what defines them is their profit motive. And the line that the Buddhist uh, monk repeats, well, how else will we live otherwise, right? Do you think a monk could eat otherwise if we didn't do that, right? So the hypocrisy between what is preached and what is practiced, doctors and pharmacists, everybody's skinning out to skin everybody else right she buys a um she you know she distrusts the doctors because she doesn't think they're going to she doesn't think that she's going to get full dose of the medicine that she needs and that she purchases the doctor will skim right skimp um and she needs some medicine because she's uh, she has tuberculosis she's consumptive so the logic of exigency and imperative for survival that overrides every other consideration in this miserable time of poverty, destruction, complete uh, ruination of a social order that used to be by the war that killed millions and displaced million, several million others. Um, the only way you can survive is as flies attacking the exposed entrails. That's what makes this the age of doubt. Even so, Jin Young is not happy with it. She cannot reduce herself to that stage, right? So here's the final page of the story. And I won't read the whole thing, but just the, the red part, right? So at the very end, that boy, comes back again in her sleep, right? She has a dream, right? Uh, the boy with the burst gut. And then what does she do after she has the dream? She gets up, she puts on a coat, she goes to the temple, Buddhist temple, where her, her boys, her dead boys, uh, mortuary tablet and photo was being kept, right? Because the uh, Jin Young's mother wanted the ghost of her grandson to have a resting place. And it's very important for Koreans, for the dead, to have the proper ritual. They become ghosts otherwise, right? Unfed ghosts. So they, Jin Young had paid money and they'd gone to do this ceremony. And even there, Jin Young was being sidelined because they didn't pay enough. Somebody who paid more money, the chief's wife, they were supposed to get the first dibs. And then she gets really disillusioned by religion. Well, she goes to the temple and she gets the, gets the, the Buddhist nun to give, him, give her her son's photograph and the mortuary tablet, and she burns it. And she says, hey, I only have bitter memories, dead, miserable memories. I refuse to say that it is otherwise. And then the last lines, I can still fight the fight, right? So here, the strategy of surviving the age of doubt for Jin Young is other than as the horde of flies. She wants to survive that age as a human being, in other words, right? And how does she do that? How does she manage to do that? Well, I would argue that she does that through a series of refusals refusal to compromise her principles, refusal to look the other way, 
refusal to be consoled. Hey, these are miserable dead memories, right? And kind of, I'm not going to turn to religion to try to give me the consolation so that I can make the daily life livable. I'm going to face the misery, right, head on. Refusal to stop fighting. And even though the English translation is fight, fighting the fight, I think it's not quite correct because the Korean word for fight is actually hango, and it's more like resistance, resistance to injustice. And such resistance can be individually expressed, but is also often socially, collectively, and politically expressed. As you see here, anti-colonial forces who call themselves a righteous army. And ultimately, these refusals are refusals to survive war-torn Korea as a fly, right, feeding on the dead. Now, if the first strategy is to refuse a negative strategy, the second, I think, is to define humanity through so terms of ye, yi, right? Ye is ritual propriety. Yi, yi is righteousness. Ye, yi. Today, ye, yi kind of is conventionally something like manners, having great manners, good manners, uh, is considered to have your, you have your, you have ye, yi. But ye, yi actually are Confucian terms with these deep Confucian notions. And yi, for example, becomes the, the slogan for the righteous army resisting colonial Japanese rule. So yi and both ye and yi have these long resonances that are very, very important historically in, in Korean, Korea. But what is the, the required condition, ex essential condition for someone to be able to show some, another person ye yi, to treat another person with ritual propriety and righteousness to try to con to to give cracked um, watermelon to a boy that's dying because he's dying of thirst, right? I mean, even though his his guts are open, showing that 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 act, right, uh, of humanity. Well, the essential condition that's required is you have to have autonomous subjectivity. If you're forced to be nice to someone then that's no yei at all. That's not ritually proper. That's not righteousness at all. And so we can go back to Ilbon Sango or Sundry Thoughts in Japan that Park Kyung Lee wrote. And her, you know, I mean, admittedly, it's a very anti-Japanese sentiment, right? But it's based on this idea of ye. For her, Japan and Japan's, Japan's colonial enterprise in Korea and the reason why being Japan's neighbor was such an unfortunate thing for Koreans is because Japan recognizes only power and not ritual propriety or righteousness, right? You treat the other person with humane ritual propriety and they recognize it as you're trying to curry favor with you because you're weak, right? And finally, I wanna come back to, uh, I, well, I wanna introduce Gong ji -young on this notion of ye yi, because voila, Gong ji uh, first book of short stories was called Ingane Dean Ye yi, translated into English as human decency. Ye yi becomes very important for her. The last line of the short story, here stands an individual who maintained ye yi toward the times, toward history, and toward fellow human beings. And I think in Park and Gong Ji Young's worldview, Park Kyung Lee, I mean, this is the line from a story about a different character, but I think this line applies to Gong Ji Young's assessment of Park Kyung Lee, someone who stood and maintained ye toward the times, toward the history, and toward fellow human beings, and did that against incredible hardship, difficulty, and odds in her own personal life. Not only was her father absent, her own husband died. Her sole surviving daughter married a writer who ended up being in prison, in Sodemon prison, for anti-authoritarian uh, resistance. Um, but, you know, she kept that pride and uh, writerly subjectivity alive in, through that entire process. Um, so I think I'm out of time, so let me just stop there. Um, I know I covered a lot of stuff. Uh, 
probably too quickly, but I'm very, I would be very pleased to kind of hear from you. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer if you have any comments.